اليوم دكتور سنوسي مشكورا على الاسسمنت اوف بروفيشنال ديفلوبمنت نيدز اوف ميديكال ادوكيتورز تقييم احتياجات تنميه الاداء المهني لدى المختصين في التعليم الطبي. تفضل دكتور. في التوك اي وود لايك تو ثانك ماي فريند ذا بريزيدنت اوف ذا ليبيان انترناشونال ميديكال يونيفرستي دكتور محمد سعد and the organizing committee of the conference for um, firstly um, a great reception and uh, hospitality and secondly for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the professional development needs of medical educators. So I'm going to start my talk by setting the scene and I'll give you a background on medical education and talk a little bit about the qualities of the good teacher in general and the medical teacher um, in particular. I will give you a general definition of standards and I will tell you why we need them. Then I'll get into the meat of my talk and I will show you an example of professional standards for medical educators and their benefits. I will speak about faculty development and I will show you a list of topics uh, that can be used for training and development of medical educators. Then I will show you a useful model that can be used to build self-awareness and identify learning needs of medical educators. I will uh, talk a little bit about how medical educators' development can benefit from feedback, reflection, and learning from experience. At the end, I will give you some concluding remarks and stop. So, what is the definition of medical education? It is a process of facilitating learning and the acquisition of knowledge, skills, beliefs, and habits. Therefore, medical education is not just the transfer of knowledge from one brain to another, it's not a uh, spoon feeding, and it's not one person regurgitating the contents of their brain in front of a group of students. Medical education is therefore a facilitating and guiding process. It is a learner-centered process, with the learner um, taking ownership of their education and learning, and we as medical educators just supporting and helping them to do so. So medical education has become a lifelong process uh, spanning over three sectors, starting in the undergraduate phase, moving through the postgraduate education and into the continuing professional development of the established clinician. The aim of medical education, I'm sure you're all aware, is to provide society with knowledgeable and skilled and up-to-date doctors and other professionals who will continue to maintain and develop their um, knowledge and skills and expertise throughout their professional life. The concept of learner-centered approach is not new. It has been suggested by William Osler over a hundred years ago when he said the successful teacher is no longer on a height pumping knowledge at high pressure into passive receptacles. Clinicians are increasingly involved in teaching, assessments, and other supervisory activities with uh, students and uh, trainees. Therefore, participation in professional development pathways and other activities in medical education enable them to deliver high quality education and training for the learners. We have to remember, however, that um, it's not just medical education that we have to uh, develop our skills in, 
but we have our other specialities as well, which we have to master and make sure that we, are, we um, continue maintaining our um, uh, knowledge and uh, skills. So what makes a good teacher and what are the qualities that we are looking for in a teacher? We expect our good teacher to make the education of his students his main concern. We want the good teacher to have a strong subject knowledge. We want him to be uh, accountable for achieving the highest possible standards in um, work and conduct. We want him to act with honesty and integrity and we want him to create a positive um, professional relationship with his students and his uh, colleagues. So what about the good medical educator or teacher? Here is a list of 12 qualities. I'm sure you can see it. 12 qualities of the good medical teacher. This list is based on a paper published in the journal of the Royal Society of Medicine in 2005 by a professor in medical education. And I think it's a straightforward and self-explanatory. You can uh, read it. I will just highlight a couple of points. Uh, first, I noted and I was very impressed yesterday when I uh, was told by faculty and by the students that critical thinking is part of the curriculum at this university. So I have to congratulate you late or congratulate all of you. The second point is providing feedback is a skill that needs to be developed through repeated practice and um, reflecting on our performance. And this needs to be developed by every single uh, medical educator. And I'm going to come back to this a little later. So we want good teachers with high qualities which means that we need to set up some standards to benchmark and measure them against. So what are standards? Standards are clear and explicit statements about key elements of a service, telling us what the service should look like in future and what we as the stakeholders should expect from that service. The standards should, should be realistic, logical, and acceptable to everyone and they should provide quality assurance to the organization and to the learners as well. The standards should also form the basis for assessments, monitoring, evaluation and uh, future planning of the <coughs> professional development of medical educators. In recent years, a number of authors have proposed uh, frameworks of academic competencies for medical educators. Therefore, uh, it's worth considering these frameworks in the um, planning of um, training programs for the medical educators. As an example, the UK-based Academy of Medical Educators have developed a framework of professional standards for medical and dental educators. The full document is, on, uh, is available online from the website and I'm just going to give you a snapshot summary of the um, framework. So here's the framework of professional standards for medical educators which is divided into core values and five main domains. Uh, to outline what we expect from medical educators in terms of knowledge, skills, and behavior. The core values include professional integrity, uh, educational scholarship, passion about medical education, and respect to all, colleagues, patients, uh, students, and so on. These core values should underpin the professional practice and development of medical educators and should also form a foundation for the five domains I mentioned before which include designing and planning learning, 
teaching and facilitating the learning and support of learners, assessment of learning and feedback to learners, educational research and scholarship, and educational management and leadership. Uh, having professional standards going to be beneficial to everyone. They can be used to set up goals, targets, and objectives for the development of medical educators and also to assess their progress. The organization can use them to recognize the achievements of the medical educators and also to support their progress. And having professional standards will ensure good quality teaching and consequently the production of excellent doctors and other professionals which will allow us to uh, provide society with what we promised, which is high quality health system and patient care. Here is a list of uh, educational topics that can be uh, used in planning uh, training and educational programs for medical educators. This list is commonly used in training the trainer and teaching the teacher uh, courses and I do not intend to go through it in detail you can read it again it is straightforward but I have highlighted a group of topics that have been shown to be very effective in aiding the uh, development of medical educators and this include um, raising self-awareness and team development effective feedback and reflective learning and I'm going to come back to this a little later. So the uh, medical educators um, learning activities can move along two different dimensions. They can move from the independent individual experience to a more collective group learning and from an informal to a more formal approach. As you can see here uh, mentorship has been placed at the center of the figure, um, which means that any form of strategy for self-improvement uh, can benefit from the support and feedback of an effective mentor. Um, learning from experience and the individual um, uh, experience uh, includes learning by doing, learning by um, observing, and learning by reflecting on our experience. On the more formal level, we learn by peer coaching, peer feedback, and student feedback. On the more formal level, on the uh, group level, as well as seminars and workshops, we, uh, most of our learning occurs in the workplace. This is just a picture of a nice peacock that I found, and I promise you it has got nothing to do with the presentation. <laughs> you may or may not be familiar with the Juhari window model, which was developed in 1955 by two psychologists, uh, Joseph Luft and Harry Ingham, initially to um, describe human interactions and interpersonal relationships, more recently, it has been used in medical education to teach self-awareness of knowledge and to identify learning needs within uh, clinical settings. Um, you may be wondering where the name Juhari comes from, and I can tell you it's the um, first names of the two individuals who um, uh, developed it, Joseph and Harry, so Juhari. Uh, so this model is about what you know about yourself and what other people know about you. And the model is divided into four quadrants. Uh, first quadrant is called the open area and it contains information that uh, the person know about himself or herself and other people uh, know about them. So it's shared knowledge, common informations. The second uh, quadrant contains information 
Uh, it's called blind area and contains information that's known by everyone else except for the individual himself. So he's blinded uh, to this information. The third box contains, it's called hidden area, and it contains information that's known by the individual, but it's not known by anybody else. And the fourth box contains information that's not known to anyone. The whole idea of the Juhari window model is to try and expand the open area as much as possible um, so that there is common and shared information between people and their understanding each other. So we can expand the open area into the blind area by uh, seeking and receiving feedback. So you can see that the open area has immediately um, expanded into the blind area. We can also expand the open area into the hidden area by self-disclosure and sharing information about ourselves with our colleagues and other team members. The expansion of the open area can go diagonally into the unknown area by self-discovery, shared discovery, and observations from other people. So now, we achieve the objective of expanding the open area as much as possible. And this is very important because the more people know about each other, the more productive and effective they will become when they are working as a team. So there are several advantages to the Johari window and it helps individuals to understand their interpersonal um, relationships and communications. It can be used to improve group dynamics, team building and intergroup relationships. It can also build self-awareness through disclosure and feedback. And it leads to greater understanding of self and greater understanding of others. Feedback is an essential tool uh, that should be central to any educational activity. Unfortunately, um, it's not used enough or it's underused in medical education. Uh, in, in, in a paper published in 1983 in JAMA, in JAMA uh, Jack End has um, defined feedback as information about individual performance in a given activity. And that information is intended to guide future performance. Giving feedback is, an, as I said, it's an essential tool and it should be developed by every single medical educator um, through repeated practice and reflection on their um, performance. This concept has been encapsulated in a statement from an article published in the BMJ in 2008. And the statement reads, clinical teachers should regard the should regard the art of giving feedback as a critical skill to be acquired through repeated practice and augmented by reflection on their own performance. And I'd just like to make a couple of points here. Feedback has been called an art. And we know that art is not easily uh, developed. It needs a huge amount of practice and experience. Feedback is also called here critical. And in this context, we are all doctors and we know what's the meaning of critical. If something is critical, then we have to do something. Otherwise, some disastrous consequences may take place. And the remedy here is repeated practice and reflecting on our uh, performance. So when do we give feedback? If I show you this kind of performance continuum and would would poor performance on the left, I think it's the left, and uh, outstanding performance on the right, most of us will tend to give feedback to people who are not performing very well. 
on the left. Um, we may occasionally give um, feedback to people who are on the extreme right, who are doing very well, and um, they require to be given uh, feedback. There is a huge area that is neglected by us, which is this area, where people have achieved what we wanted them to achieve, um, or maybe a little bit better, but we still um, don't give them feedback. That's why I said it is greatly underused. There is a huge amount of research um, telling us that feedback needs to be given all across the line of continuum. If we want our individuals or learners or trainees to um, uh, work at an optimum level. For feedback to be effective, three components have to be present. And there are giving feedback, receiving feedback, and soliciting or seeking feedback. And these are represented by the heads of a triangle. If one of these is absent, then feedback is going to be ineffective, and we may be just paying lip service or looking for justification or excuses, or we may cause uh, the individual who's receiving feedback to be demotivated. For fee feedback to be of any value, it has to be constructive. And obviously, it has to help rather than to hurt. It has to be mostly positive rather than negative. Uh, it has to be timely, specific, and clear to avoid any confusion or misunderstanding. And it has to focus on behavior that can be changed rather than the personality of the individual or behavior that cannot be changed. It has to be limited to the amount the individual can deal with. Otherwise, they will get overwhelmed and has to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. Now, frequently we have to give combination of positive and negative feedback, and the feedback sandwich is a good way to deliver uh, a negative feedback as a stuffing to a sandwich. So we start by giving a piece of positive feedback, followed by negative feedback, and then more positive feedback to dampen the impact of the negative feedback. Feedback improves performance and aids learning, but most importantly, it helps us to identify and understand our strengths and weaknesses, and also to um, help us develop and implement strategies to improve our practice and overcome our uh, weaknesses. This is a uh, quote from Benjamin Disraeli, who is a previous British Prime Minister. And he says, to be conscious that you are ignorant is a great step to knowledge, and feedback plays a huge role here. Uh, there is an increasing emphasis on the use of reflection in uh, medical education and learning from our experience is called reflective learning. And if this occurs in the context of work, then we call it reflective practice. John Sanders, in an article published online, online in 2009, has defined reflection as a metacognitive process that creates greater understanding of self and situation to inform future thinking and action. And the next slide should explain this clumsy statement a little bit more. So the idea of reflective practice is based on the assumption that we learn from uh, experience. Uh, David Kolb, who is an American educational theorist, has proposed a model that can help us understand how we learn from re reflecting on our experience. So as medical educators, we do things and we engage in activities with our learners and of course with our patients. And this is called a 
concrete experience in the model. And that starts the experiential learning cycle. So we think about what we did, what went well, what didn't go so well, and so on. And this is called reflective observation, and that helps us learn more from our experience. And we develop new ideas and concepts. This is called abstract conceptualization in the Kolb's model. We try out the new concepts and ideas that we discovered, and if, uh, this is called active experimentation. And if they work for us, then we incorporate them into our practice, and the cycle will continue um, us practicing, having experience, reflecting on it, and then learning and uh, trying it out in the real world, and so on and so forth. <coughs> There are several advantages to experiential learning. They can accelerate, it can accelerate the learning process and encourage, encourage critical thinking. And again, critical thinking is a very important theme that keeps coming back. Um, it improves problem solving and enhances decision making skills. It helps us develop hands-on experience, which leads to better retention of uh, knowledge and concepts and it improves learners' engagement levels and it also helps them to take ownership of the situation. The whole issue of experiential learning can be summarized in this quote from Aristotle, Aristo in Arabic, the Arabic we call him Aristo, and he says, for things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. So it's learning from experience. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, this slide tells me that I'm coming towards the end of my talk. So I will conclude and bring the whole thing to a close. So I talked to you about medical education and the concept of learner-centered approach and the qualities of the good teacher. <laughs> I gave you a general definition of standards and told you, told you why we need them. I um, explained to you the framework of professional standards for medical educators from the Academy of Medical Educators in the UK. I have discussed faculty development and showed you a list of topics that can be used in training and uh, development of medical educators. I've um, discussed the Johari window model, which can, use, which can be used to build self-awareness and identify learning needs of medical educators. And I've discussed how medical educators' development can benefit from feedback, reflection, and learning from experience. On this note, ladies and gentlemen, I stop. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you.